It's a board game across the galaxy, avoiding other spaceships of various unknowns. Sounds like my life for two to six players, so I'm out of luck. And Commander Rick knows about a board game that hasn't even been released yet, a science fiction board game. It's called Planet Search, created by Roy and Odile Bod from Peterborough, Ontario. They spent five years and $100,000 to develop the game. The goal is to reach the planet Tybus and return safely, dodging all sorts of interstellar hazards along the way. It's a really complicated game, different every time you play. At least I've heard it's different every time you play. Unfortunately, it's for two to four players. And so I'm out of luck again. Looks like the only thing I can play with is my Nintendo. Lots of news in the world of science fiction books. Harlan Ellison has just sold almost everything he wrote, some 21 books worth, to Zebra Publishing. They're going to print them as the Harlan Ellison Library. The Harlan Ellison Library? Ooh, just don't be late returning your books or it'll scream your head off. And two of my favorite anthologies that Harlan edited, Dangerous Visions and Again Dangerous Visions, are going to be done up as paperbacks. If you don't have copies, they are more than worth the price of admission. And rumor has it that the last Dangerous Visions is going to be published in 1991. But hey, that rumor's been around for five years now, along with Jim Steranko's 300-page graphic novel. Don't hold your breath. OK, so we've heard how the writers turn out the manuscripts. But who takes those 500 8 by 11 sheets of paper and turns them into a nice little 695 paperback that starts making money for them? The publishers and the editors, that too. But who are these people? What do they want? Well, they're just people. They're just humans. They're not monsters. Let's talk to one of them. Laurel Bernard, just been named science fiction editor at Penguin Books for Canada. Laurel? Laurel, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm down here, Rick. Oh, there we go. Here, lock you down. There we go. Laurel. Laurel. Um, hi, Laurel. How are you doing? I'm just fine, Rick. Yeah, we're nice people, remember? Be uh -huh. nice to uh -huh. us. You feel the pressures of the job are getting to you now that you're the uh, editor there. <laughs> Well, it, uh, sometimes I have a hard time even picking out one manuscript. Uh, 500 pages is really short for some of the ones we get. Tell us about your background before. Uh, where did you come from originally? How uh, did you get into the position of science fiction editor there? I used to uh, work for a newspaper. Uh, one of the beats I covered was prisons. And, you know, that's been very useful in dealing with authors. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, here we go. <laughs> And uh, then I was, uh, you know, worked on the magazine section of the of the newspaper. You can say the name of the newspaper here. Oh, can I? Okay, it was the Whig Standard down in Kingston, a fine, fine newspaper. Oh, uh, clever. <laughs> uh. Although, as so I expected, never to see. Expected this. In fact, this doll here I have on my shoulder. This uh, this parrot um, uh -huh. is a gift from my former boss at the Whig Standard. Oh. <laughs> now, are you? Did you grow up looking at or uh, reading science fiction or? Yeah, absolutely. All the long, the longer trilogies, the better. Just love reading my way through them. Now, how many science now in your job? How many science fiction manuscripts are you reading a week? Well, we had a little piece in the the Toronto Star recently, and since then I've had 15 manuscripts, and I think one of them came today, and it was in four volumes. <laughs> Really? I've had about uh, 80 or so since I started at Penguin. And, and how much of it is real crap? Um. Well, I wouldn't be as ugly as to say real crap, but let's say that 90% of it I could probably send back almost right away. Um, uh, fantasies. So you're living for that 10% that... Yeah, I mean, that's what we all hope, you know. And have you gotten anything that so far in the short time you've been on the job? Uh, well, in fact, there is one. Um, I can't tell you much about it because we're still <laughs> working on it, but it's really great, and it's somebody who's completely unpublished, oh. and has just been working away, just like all those other people out there, um, trying to get you know, a manuscript was accepted by a publisher, and he's had a couple of close misses, and, you know, maybe we'll be it. Uh, but most people, it's, you know, you know, try harder, go back, uh, that kind of thing. But a lot of people phone me up, and they ask me what you want me to write, you know? It isn't like that. It's if you write something original and, and different, that's what we really notice, you know? If I, I can, that first page, even, I can see right away if it's something you know, whether it's another sort of Conan the Barbarian imitation or it's something really new. And, you know, that's what we really like, creative original talent, you know. That's what, that's what it's all about. <laughs> now, a lot of Canadian about. writers are saying, well, not a lot, but people may think, well, being Canadian uh, hurts my chances. True or not true at all, is it? Well, not with Penguin, because that's what we're looking for. Okay. Um, you know, there's lots of U.S. writers and lots of U.S. publishers uh, If I was a Canadian market. writer sending it down to the U.S., do you think that would make a difference, the fact that it comes from from Vancouver instead of Seattle or whatever? No, it might make a difference if you set it in Vancouver. Or wow. <laughs> but, uh, 
Although, I mean, some of them, like Charles de Lintz, are, are set in places like Ottawa, and, you know, he's doing quite well with those. And Tanya Huff was just saying that she's set one of her stories in Toronto. Yeah, but before you're established, it would probably be a bit of a problem if you did ah. set it. Yeah, it depends. Some Americans think of Canada as very exotic, so <laughs> it can vary. But on the whole, you'd probably be safer setting it somewhere a bit more indeterminate. So, uh, again, when people are asking, what do they, what do you want, there's, there's really no formula. You're looking for something original. That's the key? Yes, it's, I mean, it's a very competitive market, especially for us at Penguin trying to break into it because this is a new line. And so, you know, we've got all the American input coming over the border. You know, something that's just like all the others isn't going to do anything for us. It's going to be something really special and individual. The people who are making it now, are they, do they have to have a background in science or even a background as an English major or... Because it seems to me science fiction is a great field to break into. Yeah, well, it's a good field for, I mean, I think a lot of the science fiction books have been people's fantasies that they thought about for years and they built up a whole little world. And so it's been a lot of fun for them. And then they turn it into a book. Um, the hard part is turning it into a book. But it does mean that it, it is something where you can really, you know, you can enjoy it and, and really sort of put something of yourself into that you may not get in your job or something like that. Right. It's really a, an outlet for a lot of people. And so it's a, it's a good place to get in. And you don't have to be, you have to be much more imaginative perhaps than the average writer. But you may not have to be quite as well researched as, for example, if you were doing a historical novel. like Chester Brown's comic books. They're dark, they're dangerous, and they blur the line between reality and fantasy. Chester's best known for his comic strip, Ed the Happy Clown. It's a modern-day book of Job. Last year, Chester was nominated for four Harvey Awards, including Best Cartoonist, Best Writer, and the Special Award for Humor. The Harveys are the annual awards for cartoonists. Named after Harvey Kurtzman, the man who started up Mad Magazine. My name? I'm Chester Brown. I write and draw a comic book called Yummy Fur. I was writing and drawing stories and um, had nowhere to publish them. Uh, so I started self-publishing it as a mini-comic. And uh, a publisher saw the stuff, liked it, and asked me to uh, ask if, if he could publish it. They're usually Xerox. They're smaller than a regular-sized comic book. They're maybe half the size of a regular comic book about um, and they, they can be put out pretty cheaply because uh, you just go to a Xerox shop, run off 100 copies, it costs you maybe $20 and uh, you're published. Okay, let's talk about cybernetics, the science of man and machine, form and function, feedback and uh, control through mechanical devices. The movie Robocop 2 is being edited as we speak. I assume you're speaking, because I am, and nobody ever listens to me when I'm talking. Robocop 2 was written by Frank Miller, who blew everyone's mind with his work on Ronin, Daredevil, and the Dark Knight Batman. The original Robocop movie was the story of a mortally wounded Detroit policeman whose nasty little shot-up bits are replaced with mechanical parts. The $6 million man filmed on a $10 million budget. If life imitates art, then death also imitates art. Now the U.S. Army is developing its very own mechanical man. Manny, as he's called, is the most advanced mechanical man anyone has ever made anywhere, surpassing even John Turner in terms of realism and lifelike abilities. He has 15 movable joints and 42 degrees of freedom. He walks, he talks, he breathes, and he sweats in his palms. And no wonder, he's going to be used to test chemical warfare suits. Manny also generates a normal body temperature so they can see how quickly he heats up when he's working in a suit in a hostile environment. Hey, I work in a suit in a hostile environment. It brings me to a thought that I've been turning over. Everybody seems to think that space suits, and jackets, parkas, everything is designed to keep us warm. These things are not designed to keep us warm. They're designed to keep us from cooling down too quickly. The human body produces way more heat than it needs. We're not very efficient machines. If we actually head a suit, a space suit, that could keep all that heat in, we would very quickly roast ourselves. 